Well, welcome to the select board meeting for um, Monday, January 21st. We'll call a meeting to order. First thing we'd like to do is approve the agenda. Is there any changes or additions from anybody? Seeing none, take a motion to approve, please. I'll make the motion to approve the agenda as presented. Second. I'll second that. Okay. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing on none, all those who wish to approve, say aye. 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 Consent agenda items for tonight are the minutes from January 14th meeting. Liquor license for back, Black Back Pub, Michael's on the Hill, Sunflower Enterprises. And uh, the last item is annual certificate of highway mileage, which there seems to be no changes. So somebody would like to make a motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda items. I'll second that. Okay. All those in favor of approving the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 So there's several liquor licenses there and the certificate, all of which need to be signed. Okay. And at this time is a chance for the public to make any comments. It seems like we got a packed house here tonight. Must be uh, people forego sitting in front of the fireplace to come down here and join us. <laughs> Nobody's interested? Alrighty. <laughs> Can move right on to budget items then. Okay. Um, I sent uh, the board budgets over the weekend on Saturday. Uh, nobody asked for copies, so I didn't make any. Um, if anybody in the audience needs any, Carla has a few. Um, the first budget to be discussed tonight is the library commissioners, uh, the library department budget. The elected library commissioners are all here, I think. And Almi is here as well. Um, so, um, Dan and company, you're, you're on if you want. You want to sit Please. I have some numbers of. What I'm passing out right now is just numbers of workouts, people coming through the door, circulations, people checking things out, adult programs, youth programs, and there's actually, I'm the art director, has another um, version that has a few more additions. Um, but in general, this is what our attendance looks like right now. And you got the letter from Bill, sort of outlining um, what our budget situation looks like this year. So I won't spend too much time going over what's already in Bill's very good letter. Thank you, Bill, for putting that together. Sure. Um, <clears throat> the big points, a um, lot of driver, drivers of expenses. You can see the expenses are $12,000, uh, $12,335 higher than budget in 2018. Um, the total increase is 2.59%. Uh, um, so some of the big drivers in those numbers is put in the letter. There's a de decrease in our transfer uh, from the library fund, and that's market driven. As the fund does better, we share more of it with the town, and that's sizable. Last year, I think we shared more with the town because the fund did so well. We've ever shared before. And so there's a big hit um, this year in that line because it didn't do as well. Um, so actually, according to our formula, we would have shared zero with the town this year. Um, but the library commissioners felt like given some of the other uh, lines in this budget that um, it was appropriate to allocate $15,000 from that fund uh, to help this year with um, that's uh, just so you know, that's about slightly less than 5% of the fund balance. The fund was um, 
uh, ended about $410,000 at the end of uh, December. And uh, as Dan said, uh, the market actually went down and the formula would have uh, had a zero transfer much like we talked at a meeting a couple of weeks ago, and maybe the library commissioners were in, in attendance, I did put together a memo for both boards about maybe we should reconsider the formula, and the library uh, commissioners have, have done that. So 15,000 is a drop of 20,600 from last year, but it's $15,000 more than normally would have been transferred. And I think going forward, there's um, a hope both for the library commissioners and for the select board from the tax stabilization fund to have a, a little bit more consistent um, uh, transfer. Uh, and, and both funds are in a position that can uh, withstand that in a, in a down year as long as you don't go hard wild with it. And I, I think everybody on the library commissioners agrees that $15,000 is doable. You'll notice from last year we're overspent a little bit. Um, a big part of that in regular pay, um, we switched directors. And so we had our current director um, chose to uh, take uh, health care. That's a difference. Um, there's a change in um, pay and there's um, the benefit line as well. So um, as Bill points out in his letter, as changes in staff happen, um, that usually means that um, there's going to be an increase in, um, in the pay line. Um, and finally, um, we have, um, and also on top of that, uh, we also had a situation where our previous director leaving um, as far as that's to do a sort of payout um, for Mary's benefits. Um, um, so those are kind of the big drivers. We do have another um, expense, in, which we're asking for uh, 20 hours of a new position, which is really a new position, but we, there's an older position that's a five-hour position that would um, that we wouldn't we would let go um, and hire someone at a 25-hour position, so 20 new hours of staff time. Um, and well, the reasoning for that is um, we're finding that our librarians in different areas, our children's librarian, our programming librarian. Um, our technology librarian, they're spending more time, given these increasing numbers that we see here, staffing the circulation desk. And that's time where they're not being a children's librarian, where they're not being a technology librarian, where they're not being a um, program librarian. So just 20 hours is really meant to free up those staff to do their sort of specialty areas. It's meant to beef up outreach to the community um, and help our director do that. Um, so then the patron services manager you see primarily staffing the circulation desk and helping with some of the programming? Correct, yep. Okay. Um, so sort of some bullet points for their responsibilities, primarily staffing the help desk, um, <clears throat> implementing those procedures um, around the circulation desk, uh, providing reference services, um, doing more outreach. Um, we've thought about delivery of books, uh, and kits to child care providers, senior housing, homebound patrons, um, overseeing our volunteers, managing overdues, and helping out with youth programming. Right now we see a lot of younger kids, we don't see a lot of teenagers. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, it shows that your youth program and attendance at youth programs was down from 2017 to 2018. Was that something conscious that happened? Or? Yeah, there's a note at the bottom um, that oh, yeah, addresses yeah. that we had a youth library who took a leave due to oh, okay, thank you. Yeah. 
afterwards. So, so your anticipation is those numbers will probably rebound in 2019? For youth programming? Yeah. Certainly, uh, with ha having our youth librarian, yeah, I would think so. Um, we missed out on a month and a half of programming, so yeah. Any other questions from the board? No, I just say it. otherwise you're to be c commended because of all the other increases in it's, use know, of the library. We're very pleased with the attendance, and um, I hope it keeps marching on this way. Um, I don't know when the appropriate time, or even if this is, if this is an appropriate time, to make a few comments. Um, I appreciate your efforts to try to keep the budget at a reasonable uh, level. Um, I'm not speaking for the rest of the board at this time, but um, in the past 10 years or so, I think the, the fire stations were completed just before Irene uh, the conditions of those fire stations, if anybody remembers back, were horrible, um, had been horrible for a number of years. And uh, <clears throat> we finally were able to uh, bond for a reasonable enough amount to uh, replace both those buildings. And the equipment that we have is pretty nice equipment too as well. Um, and then after Irene, you know, the troubles that we all went through here in town, that brought us to the point of where we are today in this new building. Um, people remember back the hurdles that we went through uh, to achieve this goal at a, again, at a, another reasonable amount. Um, we've satisfied some pretty great needs in this town at a uh, pretty significant savings compared to some of the amounts that we were originally looking at. But now the town is faced with another issue. Uh, it's not glamorous, it's not pretty, but it's probably one of the most important issues that any town faces, and that's the condition of our infrastructure. Um, when I got on this board six years ago, uh, one of the reasons I got on is because I could see that our infrastructure was starting to significantly de deteriorate. Um, you know, we've worked over the last few years here to kind of band-aid things along, but it's apparent to me that uh, if we don't start to focus on some of those issues, that uh, we're going to be in some pretty big trouble here for too long. Um, so moving forward, it's going to be my effort uh, to try to hold the line as much as possible. I mean, if you think back to the library that we were operating out of and the fire stations and the municipal building that we are operating out of, we've gone from macaroni and cheese to state and it's time to step back and you know work within our means with the great facilities that we have and try to bring all our focus on the next big problem which is our infrastructure uh, last year we were able to double our CIP paving CIP from 330,000 in the past, which some years wasn't even met, to 660,000. And we were able to get a significant amount of asphalt work done. Um, that's just the tip of the iceberg of the things that it, the roads and bridges work that needs to be done in this town. So it's my goal to ask the department heads to do whatever they can to try to hold the line on their expenditures and live, like I said, live with the stake that we've got for now and try to funnel what 
additional revenues that we can possibly gather up into fixing our roads because you know it's one of the it's a highway our highway budget is by large the biggest budget we got and uh it's following behind probably uh <laughs> in a much bigger way so uh, just, uh, make a note uh, I guess I have three three things to also note um, well for first you know we're still we understand the town is still paying off the building um, and that debt services um, a big part of what you see in our budget still um, this position was originally asked to the commissioners as a full-time position, and we understood that um, on top of the salary, that all the benefits that come with it, that wasn't going to be a realistic ask this year. Um, so we've we've uh, tried to be mindful of all the things that you're describing, and so we're asking for 20 hours, not. 35 plus of all the associated benefits. Um, also, this is not something new. We had talked about it last year. Our numbers were still going up, or were started going up, obviously, last year. Um, our previous director, Mary, wanted this position, and we didn't go for it last year because we understood that the town was trying to go for a forget what the tax rate was last year, zero percent? Was it totally holding the line? So we were cognizant of that, and we did not score it last year. Um, and thirdly, we have made cuts in the past as the town has come back, or we've, um, we have reduced our budget in the past as other departments have needed certain things as the um, other priorities in the town <laughs> took priority. We've, we've made productions in the past to, to our budget. Um, so I guess I just ask you to be mindful of those three, three yeah. things. I think in particular the, the book budget at $28,000, I don't have all of my records with me, but it, it's, I don't think it's any higher at all now than it was in 2011. If it is higher, it's higher just marginally. Mm -hmm. And after the flood, there was a number of years that uh, you know they had dropped that down. Um, and I think last year was the first year they got it back up to 28. So it's it's not even an increase. It's the same level that it was five years ago, probably. And, and <clears throat> much to the surprise of some people, uh, people do still read real books. And you know they buy lots of books. Um, you know there are e-books and audio books and everything else in that line item. It's not all physical books, but um, the main, <clears throat> you know, I think in my memo, um, you know, there's about fifty-five thousand dollars worth mm -hmm. of things that either aren't personnel related or aren't um, physical plant related, and and uh, you know <clears throat> when. When they were talking about the 35-hour position, uh, one of the things that Almi had done was, you know, the book budget went down, the computer services budget went down, you know, trying to make room for the the ask that she made. And when the commissioner said, "No, we really can't afford to go to a 35-hour position," and frankly, the big gamble with a 35-hour position is. You know, you could end up with twenty-two thousand dollars worth of health insurance with mm -hmm. that position, um, and it's unfortunate that health insurance is still so uh, closely tied to employment. But that's the way it is when you offer good benefits like we do. Um, so when when the commissioners cut that back and made it net twenty-hour gain as opposed to thirty-five-hour gain, that was asked for, um, you know, I encouraged them to consider putting the book budget back to the 28 where it was and the computer services budget and a few of the other things back to what the ask was. Um, you know, one of the things that we're going to try to eliminate going forward, Chris, and we, we can't do it this year um, in the library fund, is to eliminate that volatility in the uh, transfer from the trust. It was nice last year when we 
when the library commissioner said we can transfer almost thirty-six thousand um, dollars, and like we said at the beginning, they could have said, "Hey, our formula in a down year says there's no transfer." Um, now going forward, I think we're going to try to keep that uh, stabilized number so we can avoid those ups and downs. You know, between the unanticipated. Um, resignation or retirement of Mary last year and then having to recruit, pay out Mary's leave time um, and a few other things that were related with that, you know, they, they lost about $20,000 of fund balance, at least on paper. Um, and the $20,000 that they're losing there and the $20,000 that they're losing in the transfer, you know, that's 40000 of the $52,000 tax increase. So. I hear what you're saying. I think I understand. We've had a lot of conversations about the infrastructure, but I think they've tried to uh, uh, submit the most uh, realistic budget that they can. Yeah, don't misunderstand me, Dan. Okay, I appreciate every department and the efforts they go through. Um, I was just trying to give you an idea where myself as a board member, uh, what I'm trying to focus on moving forward and uh, you know in the past the infrastructure has always been the sacrificial lamb that's why we're kind of in the boat we're in um, I know that the first thing when I looked at uh, uh, the narrative last night um, of your budget and uh, saw the difference between the uh, what came out of the trust last year and what came out of it this year I mean you'd have to be a dummy to not realize that uh, the stock market in the last month and a half or so has plummeted, which probably caused that to happen um, or had something to do with it. But, uh, you know, if I guess I would ask if there's any any possible way, I don't know the condition of that trust, um, that some, some maybe some more could be eked out of it to, you know, offset that uh, that difference at all. Would you, would you consider it? Um, but again, uh, just moving forward, uh, uh, my goal uh, is to try to focus on the infrastructure problems we got um, before they get too awfully much more out of hand, you know. So appreciate all you've done. And the rest of the board? No, I, um, I just want to say that I appreciate what you did do with the trust fund. Um, er everything that's been said here, uh, I what I heard was uh, really given the formula that had been in place, the expectation would have been that would have been zeroed out. And through the, uh, the foresight of the commissioners, they were willing to recommend that, uh, that adjusted amount. Um, and in the proposal for the new position, it looked like you um, utilized an existing um, part-time position and blended that together and still kept it at as reasonable a rate as you could you could possibly see. Given the numbers that you're showing here, um, I think it would be irresponsible not to support some level of assistance, particularly with the, with the circulation. Um, one of the things with the programming in any facility like that is if you don't have proper supervision and oversight, it just leads to further problems down the road. Um, the growth is there, and the request at uh, a little bit over 2.5% uh, is certainly not an unreasonable thing. Um, going back to what Chris offered up, we've got a lot of competing issues. Um, so this is one of those that we we need to balance out, but I think the work that you did was a very reasonable and considerate proposal, and it looked to be sensitive to the issues that the town faces, so thank you. The other thing, too, that I'd just point out, and I, I did mention it, <clears throat> it's kind of right in the uh, third paragraph on the second page of the narrative. Um, Dan mentioned the debt service, <clears throat> and the library does pay $124,000 this year towards the debt service. But there's the other transfer to the Municipal Building Operating Fund, and that dropped considerably from $177,000 uh, uh, last, I mean, from $77,105 last year to uh, 
$52,780. And, you know, fortunately, that that decrease kind of uh, knocks out the increase this year in the, in the regular pay line. I think going forward, I'm, I'm not here to say that it's going to drop again as much as it did this year. You know, it went down, um, what, 20, almost 20, a little more than $24,000. But, um, you know, as the building matures and will have, you know, soon enough, the building will be old enough that we'll have to start about thinking about painting and things like that. But um, a lot of the time that uh, Bill Woodruff uh, had to spend in this building just working out the bugs the first couple of years of operation kind of gone away now. So I think that's going to be a sustainable number as well. And going forward, you know, that might actually drop down a little bit. So um, I, I think all in all, on the budget side, it's about as good as we can do this year. And the only way to, uh, to make the tax rate less, I mean, the tax increase less than it is right now is either you got to say no to that position or you have to raise the the level of uh, transfer from the from the from the trust, and uh, given the growth in the library, I think Dan and the commissioners have made a good case for we need to have the staffing to to meet what the public is demanding, and the the transfer. Um, if you transfer more this year, you just put future transfers in peril because you're going to take away too much from the corpus of the fund and, and you know, it won't be able to grow uh, as you need it. Um, as I said at the, in the last paragraph, um, you know, the, the, the only control that the select board really has is how much taxes it recommends to the voters. Um, and if you recommend $485,585, this budget can go forward just as it is. If that number gets uh, lowered by the voters, uh, then the commissioners have to go back to the drawing board and decide how they're going to make up that difference. But I, I hope it doesn't come to that. And certainly not yet. We, we haven't, we've got another week anyway to look at numbers. and. Um, Things are looking a little better this week to me than they did last week. I'm not in a position to tell you what the tax rate is going to be yet. But on the revenue side of the general fund, things are uh, a little better than they, than they looked a, a week or so ago to me. So, Only? May I say a couple things? Sure. Come up to the mic. Please. Just wanted to turn it on. I just wanted to make a couple of points. That's on. Um, one is you may not think of the library this way, but a good, a good public library is actually an economic driver for a town. Just like having a good school system attracts people and businesses because their, their employees are going to want to live there, a good library also attracts people to the town, and that, of course, always helps the tax base. Um, so. And then the second point I want to make is, uh, oh, and, and also the library itself does a number of things um, that helps people who are looking for jobs. Uh, we have, as you might know, almost all jobs now are applied for online. Uh, and we have public computers that we see plenty of people coming in and filling out their job applications, looking for jobs. We have a community bulletin board where uh, employers can post job, job and training opportunities. Um, so we contribute to the, the local economy in that sense as well. Um, and what Chris was saying about having this wonderful facility is absolutely true, but it would be a shame to have the facility and not be able to use it to its full capacity and full potential. And the very best thing that we can do to reach that potential is to have adequate staffing um, because it's the staff is the most important part of running a library and um, I would like to see that happen so I hope you will support the budget thank you I'll just say as we were going through different iterations we had um, situations where we asked 
if you could have more in the line for books or more in the line for computers or staffing, um, which would it be? And staffing, what's the answer right now? That's not always the case, but as of right now it is. Um, I think the library's been pretty cognizant of um, being watched by the voters um, as we have this new facility. I know there were, there's a sentiment out there of, well, now it's going to have to be more people because we have this big new building. So we've been, um, our previous director, Mary, certainly uh, was uh, judicious about asking for, for new, um, new people. And as I said last year, uh, she, she wanted to replace this position, and we didn't. Um, so now we are, and we're trying to be as judicious as we can. And I just want to say again, Dan, I appreciate that. I don't want people to misunderstand what I was trying, the point I was trying to get across, okay? I, I appreciate all the departments and everything they do here. Uh, no, honestly, so, yeah. I do. Yep. So thanks for everything. Thank you. The rest of the board all set? Yeah, I'll just chime in and say that I, I think it's great to see. I always fear seeing a decrease in usage. You never know with technology if that's really going to affect uh, a library, so I think that's a great thing to see. I guess my one quick question is, um, how, how does that, do you have any idea how usage uh, over population compares to other libraries in the area? And is there, are there specific goals that you create there, or do you just try to do as much as you can to create an amazing resource and then hope people find it and continue to use it? Uh, one thing I'll say, I'll be mentioned in a meeting um, a couple weeks ago that just as a general trend, um, door counts, I believe, are going up, but circulation of print things as a trend is going down. So the fact that we have an 8.6% uptick in circulating items is impressive. Um, it, it's way over what the trend is for public libraries right now. Do you have more to add on me about just certain general trends versus where we are? I know the statistics. I know that statistics are available to compare uh, Vermont libraries with each other uh, at the Vermont Department of Libraries website. Um, I haven't really spent enough, much time since September looking at those. Um, or since December when I did the end of the year statistics. Um, so I can't really give you off the top of my head how we compare to other libraries of a similar size. Um, my guess would be we're on par, if not slightly above. Um, but I could get you those numbers for my next quarterly update, if you like. I had asked um, last time Omni was here, uh, if you had a, guys had an idea of um, increase in out of town, uh, either memberships or attendance? Have you seen any? I don't have those oh, numbers, but okay. I can see Yeah, I was just curious, you know. Uh, it, it looks like in this line item here, the budget for 2018 was roughly $2,000 in non-resident fees, and the actual was twenty five seventy. so it was up. Oh, yeah. yeah. I can, I can tell you, um, just sort of anecdotally, you might be interested in this. You, I'm sure, are aware of the Stowe Library's flood that they had a month and a half ago or so, and they've been closed since then. It looks like they're going to be closed for a while. Um, and we have seen quite a number of Stowe residents come in um, from the very first day that that happened using our computers and our printers and so on. And um, now we've had somewhere between 15 and 20 Stowe card, uh, library card holders actually get cards in Waterbury, um, which I assume they will use until the Stowe Library reopens. Um, and probably the largest number of our non-resident um, people are from Duxbury, which doesn't have uh, its own public libraries, you know. So um, you, I, I think the number is on there for the total number of new patrons that we had this year. I think it was 406, or last year rather, to 2018, um, which was a pretty healthy number. It was a little lower than the first year we opened, but it was in the same ballpark, which was nice to see. Technology library is also very busy these days. We've gotten uh, nice letters from folks in the community saying, 
I couldn't teach my mother-in-law how to use her email, but I, the, the technology librarian has given her homework and managed to uh, get her up and running. And um, her, she's uh, I think as busy as can be right now, um, helping people, um, doing one-on-ones with folks, teaching them basic tech skills. Good. Terrific. I guess we can let you off the hook. All right, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Thank, thank you, Dan. So, uh, Karen Nevin is here from Revitalizing Waterbury, um, and she will run you through their budget. Yeah. I don't know what you can see and what you haven't. Sorry about that. <laughs> I've got both of these. You do? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then I have a Got it? Received a has received for many years a uh, support from the town, and we are almost level funding. What we've asked in the past are um, the operating general operating ask is seventeen thousand dollars. This is an amount you've given to us for many many years. It's basically a thousand dollars a month for the support of revitalizing Waterbury plus a five thousand um, dollar piece that's for brand stewardship and marketing. And then a couple years ago, uh, you began supporting our economic, de um, economic development through Revitalizing Waterbury. And we are asking for a small increase that includes a uh, salary increase for our economic development director. Um, and that, uh, that increase would begin on April 1st after the town uh, meeting, if you uh, approve it. Uh, we've also continued to support your um, putting $5,000 in the planning department's beautification budget. We work really closely with Steve Lodgepeak to uh, work on um, many beautification projects in this town, including the holiday trees, flowers, uh, banners, a variety of things. Um, so that is our ask. I've uh, included a... Uh, little graphic for you to show you how your support has gone over the years. And in the last three years, you can see that we have continued to increase our budget, but the percentage of our budget that is funded by the government or you has continued to go, go down. Uh, this is something that the board of directors is incredibly cognizant of, and we work on very, very carefully as we do our budgeting and as we uh, seek to support the activities that we do. Uh, the other document I gave you is our uh, town report, which I delivered to Carla on Friday, uh, which sort of details everything we did in 2018. And we do a lot. I think you're aware of our mission, which is to preserve, promote, and enhance the economic, social, and historic vitality of Waterbury, Vermont for residents, businesses, and visitors. That includes economic development, marketing, promotion, beautification of the town, and um, coming soon, everything in street construction. <laughs> we are in full operation mode to get, uh, get started on that. We have a, an important meeting tomorrow with the, uh, um, the contractor for the project. We work closely with Bar and Bar, the be trans liaison. It's really a three-pronged team of um, Alyssa, economic development, myself, marketing and promotion, and Barb Farr, uh, contract, residence, person who knows everything about 
the contract and the people and the trans and things like that. So um, I'd like to ask, tell me if you have any questions. I was actually having a conversation about uh, the reconstruction project today and, and its possible impacts here in, in the village. Um, I'm optimistic that the businesses will weather the storm relatively good, uh, best we can hope for, you know. And uh, I'm sure with your help, that will uh, encourage people to support them and see us through this difficult time. But uh, people just have to keep in mind of uh, if they can envision what the other side will be like, uh, I think it uh, be well worth it in the end. I think the operative word there is optimistic. And we are incredibly optimistic. The fact is, is we are somewhat excited about tackling this project because we are going to be rolling out different kinds of programs to support the businesses. Alyssa's already working on business support workshops. Uh, we have marketing plans. Uh, there's uh, it, it comes, it's a broad range of, of activities and things that uh, we know we're going to be on those street uh, daily. We are hiring a, a part-time marketing assistant and revitalizing Waterbury solely for Main Street, who is going to be really helping us to execute all the activities. Um, that funding comes through um, the state of Vermont, Vermont with the B-Trans project, so it's a restricted uh, position, but being able to add a second person, a third person in our office to really support Alyssa and I to do social media, graphic design, pounding on the pavement, knocking on doors, and ask, helping and listening and taking care of things. Um, honestly, I think we're all excited. I mean, really, we're ready to get it started. <laughs> yeah, that, um, <clears throat> I was going to say, it won't be for a lack of trying on both RW's part and the municipal staff. We're gearing up for this uh, pretty much constantly of late. Uh, the money that Karen just mentioned, um, you know, we, we, the town, worked hard with um, with VTrans to get this money. Uh, it's not, it doesn't show up in the request that Karen has put before you, but the money that VTrans is making available will be coming through the town and then we, we pay them. It, it was actually, uh, I don't know, $8,600 or something last year yes. that uh, you'll see in a, in a different budget probably next week. But um, over the course of the, of the three years or four years counting last year, I guess, um, I don't have the number, Karen may know it, but um, all but about $6,000 will be covered by VTrans, and that $6,000 uh, local contribution will come at the end of the project in, in the last year, I think. So um, they're ready to go. Um, we're ready to go, and we just need a few more months to go by on the calendar and snow and cold to go away. <laughs> be from one storm to the next. No, what's encouraging, what's encouraging for me is uh, I guess a little bit of the ray of sunlight is the fact that, uh, you know, TD Bank North had sold and somebody purchased it. And um, then across the road there at Jeff Larkin's place, you know, I don't know if it's any competition to mark, but um, the people moving in there. Uh, and I think those, I, if I had to guess, those people are strategically positioning themselves for the other side of this construction project. So that in itself is encouraging. Well, I think it's one thing is Alyssa, I give Alyssa a lot of credit for working with the um, business owners and the property owners in this town to really make sure people understand the impact of Main Street construction, understanding this is actually a great opportunity to get into town, sort of work out the kinks of a business while you're, you know, while things are going on and, and then you can get started. And, um, we are really uh, ready to support all the businesses in many, many ways. Uh, we've spent, we've done a lot of research. We visited Middlebury, uh, which is having a train uh, <coughs> tunnel built underneath their main street. Um, then we visited Brandon. If you went to Brandon last summer, you got it. We got a real glimpse of what we're getting 
And so it's going to be dusty. It's going to be dirty. It's going to be confusing. Um, but the one thing that really stood out was the um, personalities and the people who were working on that project and how happy they were to help us. Uh, and the idea of having everybody in the community um, be excited and understand that we just got to get through this. And in the meantime, it's my job, Alyssa's job, and Barb's job to get as much information out there as often as we can. We developed the waterwayworks.com website that was part of the 2018 money we spent from VTrans. If you haven't been there, you should. If you haven't signed up for the alert system, you should. How's that for a plug, list? <laughs> <laughs> so um, waterwayworks.com, which is, will be the central place for all the information we've got going on. At the same time as Main Street's going on, Revitalizing Waterway will continue to do all the other work that we always do, which includes the promoting of the town and the community of the you know the tourism businesses in this town, beautification. We have amazingly fun plans and ideas for beautification of this town when it's dusty and dirty, and the design committee is getting really excited and um, supporting the the community, the town, and moving forward. Yahoo. Yahoo. <laughs> I can be a cheerleader if you want. <laughs> You're doing a great job already. Yeah, I'll jump in and just say that I appreciate all the work that RW and its volunteers do. I think you guys do a lot for very little in terms of a budget. Um, yeah, I mean, as a business owner downtown, I have incredible excitement and fear at the same time. I think <laughs> um, it's interesting that Mark's on your board, and we saw just quickly, you know, what Mark at Craft Beer Cellars went through on a small construction project in front of his building. So um, I think it's going to be a lot of effort on all the businesses to try to figure out how to find some something to, to celebrate and actually try to turn it into a positive and, and I'll definitely try to come up with some ideas. But I will tell you that for Revitalizing Waterbury, we spent 2018 not only exploring other towns but experiencing two things. Route 100 construction was a great learning experience for us. For example, how a contract that could be written on stone means nothing when it's raining out. So things change, you've got to be flexible. And then the Elm Street project really was an example of sort of how important communication, being on the ground, being there in front of the businesses and letting them know that we're here to listen to them. And that project was sort of, we knew it was going on, but it was just sort of over here. It wasn't right here. Yeah. And it was an amazingly good piece of information for us. And the importance of having people on construction crews understanding that they're part of the community while they're in town and they need to support us. And we're looking for friendly attitude. We're looking for people who are happy to be, you know, working hard to help us. So it was an amazingly important learning experience, and we have taken it and added it to our, uh, you know, our plans of how to move forward. Mm -hmm. Give you a little taste of what. Yeah, a little. Yeah. <laughs> what the bigger of what the bigger deal is going to be about? Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm happy to hear your excitement about this, and because I was one of those. Uh, I was one of those folks that it was sharing my um, my worry that this you know, beautiful town that is now fully kind of built out downtown. It's 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 a much different town business wise than it was 15 years ago, and we've got some great businesses down there. And I'd hate to see any one of them go away. So I'm I'm glad to I'm glad to hear that there's a cheerleading effort out there to to keep everybody's spirits up and keep them looking towards the end game. We're going to be yeah. celebrating every milestone. There'll be enough parties in this town. <laughs> so you don't, you know, we just we plan on celebrating everything. Um, we've ordered from Stantec uh, some um, before and after images so people can start seeing what it's going to look like and be able to share those images out. Um, and so people will sort of understand where we're going. How are you going to share those? A variety of ways. Uh, we kind of wish it would be on the town report, um, cover the town report. That was one place, but I don't think we can get them in time. Um, they're going to be on the website, whether there are postcards or posters and uh, flyers and places where people will see them. We will see them. Um, Any of the board have anything else they'd like to ask or? 
What would be the best way to um, to approach you if uh, you know somebody stopped one of us on the street and started to express uh, concerns over something, and you might, you know, uh, I may, may, may or may not have the answer. Well, let me tell you. All right. <laughs> thought about this. <laughs> you know, um, we are beginning to put together something that we're calling "Changing the End of the Story." And that is the idea of when people in this community, leaders in this community, um, have interactions in town with others who are upset or angry or complaining, that you have information and you have tools and you have ways to help change the story, help them change the experience, understand what's going on. We'll be doing some trainings in the community uh, for business owners and businesses will come, you know what? Give us 15 minutes before a select board meeting, we'll come here and train you guys too. So you really understand. Because we want you to be able to talk confidently about the project and to know who to go to. And there are, the, the, the answer is if you don't have the answer, please call Barb, Karen, or Alyssa. Here are their numbers. We, they're gonna be everywhere. Um, listen, that's what most people just wanna hear is have people want you to listen. I'm going into training mode right here. I apologize. But yeah. Are you going to be doing something with, on WDEV, like kind of a regular update using the radio station? Yeah, we have a meeting with WDEV, I think tomorrow afternoon, or it might be Wednesday. I can't remember to talk to them about their uh, our partnership. But uh, Steve Cormier um, is really excited about um, being supportive of the project. Uh, we will have a pipeline for um, press releases. And uh, yeah, that will be a primary source of information, as will uh, Watery Record, as will Front Porch Forum, as will email blasts. I'm sure you guys have talked about it too, but I think there's an opportunity to, to try to boost re revenues before and after the construction. So instead of trying to push people into the construction scene, there might be a, a more opportunity maybe to try to, I mean, like April's terrible for, like it, that's a dip in business, April, November are the two. Mm -hmm. But if we can get ahead of the construction hitting downtown and throw a party prior to it, to try to boost revenues for everyone to help just have access cash for the dip. Because mm -hmm. I, I know I, I took meetings years ago in Barry. Um, we met with um, some of the people involved there, and they had estimated the revenue drop was about 30%, I believe. Um, and they had a parallel road. So yeah. it's, a, it's a big difference. But I think there is some opportunity to say, hey, it's going to happen. Let's have a party. And now it's done. Let's have a party. And let's try to like help everyone out who might be struggling. So. Just some food for thought. It is good food for thought. Thank you. Good idea. Anything else? So along with that, please support our budget. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, I think, yep, Gary's here. Gary Dillon, Fire Chief. Um, can you come up to the table, Gary? Uh, again, not to steal any of Gary's thunder, but uh, I sent this out yesterday. Um, the, the spending of the fire budget is about a 1% increase, uh, $7,300. And that $7,300 increase, which is 1%, includes a 5% increase that I put into the transfer to the capital fund, knowing that we never can have enough money in the fund where we're going to uh, have to you know, buy new fire vehicles down the line. So um, it's pretty much a maintenance budget, but uh, Gary was very willing and eager to come in and share a little with you. So you're wrong. We also are doing a beautiful night like tonight. <laughs> could be a lot colder. Yeah, you could have been like the firefighters there the other night. I see on the news there that we're attending that restaurant that burned. I forget where it was. Uh, Dover. Uh, well, yeah. 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 That was when a it, misfortune. Like below zero, not counting the wind chill. That route, it literally keeps me awake at night knowing that we're going to go out and it's going to be really cold. <laughs> And it just, it's, the people that have the fire, it stinks. For the members that are standing outside, uh, you know, 20 below temperature, that's, that, it really, that, that's the stuff that keeps me awake on a cold night. Because the house is warm. <laughs> it's not warm outside. 
Yeah, things, uh, things don't work quite as well either, do they? No, and then there goes the uh, maintenance budget because you just froze up uh, two and a half or three pumps and yeah. your hose is frozen up and you got to find a flatbed to haul it back on. <laughs> it's not pleasant. Um, Bill summarized the budget very well. Um, there are some things that we went over budget on last year. Um, but for the most part, they were all areas that we had no control over. Um, so, you know, the things that we went over on were the pay, uh, equipment maintenance. We just had a lot of equipment maintenance this, this year. Uh, dispatching a little bit. Um, the internet and phone system, that will be adjusted this coming year because of the new phone system. Uh, water. Uh, heat generator, vehicle maintenance was over a little bit. We've got two engines that are costly to maintain because they're 20 years old or close to it. Diesel, uh, we went over training by 93 bucks. I'll eat that one. Uh, and travel by uh, $50. That said, the areas that we do have some control in, um, like office supplies, the, the, the canteen for when we do have those calls, tools, um, public relations, and new equipment, we were under budget. Um, so we're not a department that, all right, we've got a budget, here's the money, let's just spend every bit of it. Um, a long time ago, uh, somebody told me you should always go over your budget by one or two percent, that justifies your increase the following year. Um, I, I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, I think you spend what you have to spend. Uh, certainly in areas, you, if you have a big fire and something breaks, you gotta fix it. I mean, that, it's just the nature of the beast. Um, you know, we, we had to replace a portable tank and they're a few thousand dollars um, from the Wallace fire. Uh, there was so much heat that we had embers and we couldn't keep enough water in the tank because we just were pumping more and more water we could get. And so we ended up with some big burn holes and uh, little pinholes, easy to fix. The other ones, it, it just became a tarp. Uh, so we don't spend money just because it's there. We spend money because we need to get the items that we've identified. Sometimes uh, we get better deals on the equipment that we list. Uh, one of our big costs is uh, gear, and this past year we had uh, less people that uh, needed to have gear replaced, so that was probably the main factor for saving the uh, $7,000 that we, we saved. That doesn't mean that we're not going to need to spend more out of that line item this year and, and maybe not get something else. Uh, so for the most part, the members are taxpayers. And we're aware that it costs us all money, and that's kind of the way the officers look at it. I have some members that, you know, it's just like your kids when you say you don't have money to get something, they tell you go to the bank and get more. Mm -hmm. um, I have some members that say just spend it and you've got to pay for it. That's not my philosophy. Um, if there are changes in, in the budget and the line items, um, I go talk to Bill, and I did that this year. Um, we had in the budget to get one item uh, this year. We worked it out with the ambulance services for ID cards that we need when we go to schools and stuff for drills. Um, they're going to continue to print them for us. Um, and so we took that money and we changed it over to uh, get some SCBA mask testing equipment. Because um, right now we would have to use the fire academy and they come up, somebody comes up on a particular day and the member sits down, they put their mask on, they do all these different things, say these different things, to make sure that the mask is appropriately fitted to them, and that's at least $35 per person, uh, not counting whatever the cost is of the uh, person that does it. Um, typically they bid and say, I'll do it for $10 a person or whatever. Uh, so we, we bought our own testing equipment, um, and it's more than, uh, what it would have cost us this year to have the fit testing, but it would be paid off in three years, and it will last significantly longer than that. So there was an upfront cost, 
but there, it's going to be a cost savings to all of us. That's what you call strategic planning. Well, <laughs> we try and do that. It's kind of like replacing, you know, gear the year before. You need to replace it so you don't have somebody go out two months later and all of a sudden it's destroyed and then you got to go over. Mm -hmm. So, you know. If you have questions, I certainly would be happy to answer them. I, one other area that I think we're going to save money that's really just come out, um, I'm not sure how much, is dispatching. Uh, we're moving our, our tower that we have up in Waterbury Center at a member's house. It's been there for quite some time. Uh, but the way that tower is set up, that person gets a check from the mutual aid system but we also have to use the microwave system from the, the state police. And that's like $40,000 just for that. And we got permission from Kent Squire and Corm. We're changing the location of our tower. We're going to put it up to the DEV building on Blush Hill. We will get better reception. The valley departments will get better reception. Mm -hmm. And we don't have to pay for the microwave. And we don't have to pay for the building. They're letting us just put it there. So how will that equate to our cost savings? It may not be much, but it may be something. Right. So that that forty thousand dollars he's talking about isn't all paid by us. That's no, no, paid, no, 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 no. Paid no. by it's, the capital district mutual aid. So no. and there we, is, we'll save a share of that. Right. It's not the. No, no, I'm not no, going to no. save forty thousand dollars. Oh, I'd be happy. <laughs> <laughs> no, that it's it's a forty thousand dollars a year that, that we have to pay public safety to use their microwave for the transmission, but. And we just had a mutual aid meeting uh, this past Wednesday, uh, last Wednesday, and uh, you know, that the, the board is planning on sharing that cost savings with the rest of us. Uh, and there's no reason to keep charging people for something that you don't need. So that happened this year, Gary, or is it next? It's happening this year. They, as soon as so they they'll can, install stuff in 2019? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's as soon as they can, actually. How many other departments do you think will benefit from that? Uh, well, the aid. entire mutual aid system will benefit to some degree, but it's primarily for Waterbury. Yep. Um, Middlesex, Moortown also use it. They get toned on two different towers. So, you know, each, we had a call earlier tonight. We get a tone, tells us what it is. They wait two minutes, they tone it again, tell us what it is again. Uh, so Middlesex and Moortown, get four of those um, because of where they're located. Some of their members live in Waterbury, some live on the other side, so they try and hit them with both towers. With this single tower, they're hoping, according to the engineer that's looking at the, the slope of the land and the tower, that they should be able to get uh, Middlesex and Moortown on that single tone or a single set of tones. So it'll help them. It probably won't do anything for Waitsfield, as much, it'll still help them. Mm -hmm. um, but it also helps the other departments when they're calling for us for mutual aid. So, uh, excellent. Mostly on this end, I think the furthest we've gone is East Montpelier for calls. Right. But, but it's the capital district mutual aid system that owns or correct. is paying for that tower. Right. So it's, it will be uh, about how many departments are in, in the mutual aid. Well, it's system. it's it's. Different because some departments are in the mutual aid system but don't pay into it because they don't they have red phones. I mean they're back in the 50s and 60s, um, but there's probably 20 departments that um, are paying for the costs right now. Right. So it's not a huge savings. It'll, but it will bend the curve down. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, they're on a fiscal year, so. We have two quarters that are set. I think I put it in here, and mm -hmm. I, you know, I just made a guess on the second two, an estimated guess. But anyway, that's good news, Gary. How uh, how have your responses or calls like on the interstate been this year in in, in comparison to past years? Is it uh, uh, a little actually, bit less? Yeah. So although it's not good for your truck, Chris, the salt brine is working. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it, we saw a noticeable decrease, and we have each year, including this year, in the, the calls on the interstate for crashes. We still have a few car fires and, or overheated vehicles, and everybody thinks they're on fire, so 20 people that call. 
but for crashes, our call numbers have, have dropped uh, because of the, the salt brine. Uh, the conditions are, are better. On a snow, snowstorm like this, it's just not much you can do, um, especially the people that think, oh, it stopped snowing, and I can now go back to 80 miles an hour, and uh, they fall off the road again. But, yeah. I wish the road conditions were like this pretty much all the time because they're just fine as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> completely, I, completely drivable and... Uh, I drove to Berlin today and I drove at a reasonable speed and I didn't have any problem staying on the road. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I was just curious because it didn't seem like you guys were visiting the interstate quite as no. much this winter yet, knock on wood. And, uh, and we haven't been up there through this storm either. Yeah. Uh, now tomorrow will probably be a little different. People will think, oh, I can again get back up to speed and they get off to the side a little bit and it's slushy and it pulls them in. But what we've really, over the last couple of years, pushed back on is uh, if somebody sees a car off the road in the median, as an example, you got five people that call 911 because they saw the car there. And when the dispatcher, the 911 call taker, takes the call, they ask a couple questions. Is there any injuries? And are there any fluids or hazards? And when the person is driving by at 60 says, I don't know, we then have to get a call. So what we've been doing um, is either on the way to the fire station or when we get there, we make a quick call to the dispatcher and say, do you have a trooper in the area? And most of the time they do. Yeah, we have one that'll be there in a, in a couple minutes. We hold our response. Um, there have been times when they say, no, we've got one coming from East Montpelier. Then we're gonna go. Um, we're not gonna have somebody sitting in their car. It might be hurt, but for a two minute delay or less, uh, we'll hold because we're talking about an engine that, you know, the replacement for it is uh, over half a million uh, and people that are on it. Uh, there are some departments, they literally will bring a tower truck on the interstate to use as a blocker. Um, fine, if you want to do that. We, we do use our trucks to block an, an accident scene. and. And it's paid off. We had a tractor trailer hit one of our trucks uh, a few years ago because it was going too fast, but it saved the people that were at that scene. We had a rescue truck that same year that was hit, not a lot of damage. Uh, and that car almost hit three members, but we are pretty aware and we always have somebody watching traffic on the interstate. Even if we got a, a big working extrication, we have somebody standing there just watching traffic. Uh, and you know, it was a, a local person who was uh, icy roads on her phone and lost control. And her response was, I was trying to hang up. <laughs> 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 so that's, that's what we deal with. Um, but yeah, the, the, the number of calls on the interstate has, has dropped. Um, we have had more fire calls. We had three working fires this year. Um, uh, the one was the, the Wallace fire. Um, we had one down on Founder Street, the old steel warehouse. Yep. Um, that was arson. They know who did it. Um, they, mm. they were able to identify that. And we had the house on the Little River Road that although it wasn't, <clears throat> it wasn't necessarily intentionally set, it was homeless people there that probably had a cigarette and because they were there illegally, that's considered arson and a bunch of mislead, a bunch of mutual aid calls. We had three working fires here. Two of the buildings are still standing. One's probably going to come down anyways. But And, you know, the, the Wallace fire was probably the most traumatic. Uh, you know, certainly no loss of life, human life. But it, it, I had, during the middle of that uh, fire, I called some primary uh, chief officers from our department and other departments saying, I'm open for suggestions. I mean, the issue was we were trucking water from the reservoir and we were connecting the hydrants on Kennedy Drive. And that was the water supply. There was just nothing else we could do. Mm. And until Waitsfield got there with their tank truck, we were finally able to balance out the need for water with the water that we were getting. Mm. Um, but we were literally dumping our tank trucks and stoves um, 
and sucking the, the tank dry, literally shutting one hose down, operating the other. Shutting one hose down, operating the other. Uh, we just couldn't keep up with it. Well, hopefully she's on her way to recovery to some extent. So. Yeah, I, I, I haven't been out there. Apparently, um, a local person is building her, her garage and house. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that's great. It's, well, it's not just her, it's the whole community that right. has benefited from that farm over the years. They're slowly disappearing. Yeah. It's unfortunate. Well, very good, Gary. I don't know if... Gary, you want to just talk briefly about the trucks? Yeah, sure. No. Um, prior to the merger of the departments, uh, 19 years ago, uh, it would have been 19... Hmm. At this time, we, uh, we were already in planning and identified, but uh, next year would be 20 years, and that's the NFPA recommendation to, to uh, replace engines and based on the maintenance that we're spending on them, it, it certainly makes sense. Uh, but we bought those two trucks when we were separate uh, municipalities. The town bought one, the village bought one. Um, we've, we've had a committee that's been working all last year on identifying replacement trucks. Bill and I have talked a number of times over the last couple of years about the best way to approach this. Do we move one forward a year, move one back a year, split them up. There's a cost savings by buying them both at the same time, not a huge cost savings, but cost savings nonetheless, especially when you consider if you wait two more years, you have that increased cost. Um, so, you know, I, I think Bill will be looking at uh, providing a recommendation to you folks on the best way, most cost effective way of replacing both of those uh, engines. How many pumps, pump trucks do we have? Three? We have three. Uh, not counting the tower. We, we right. use that for something. No, I understand. But, um, you know, just in case somebody says, well, can we, like, push one back a year and then put, you know, try to get them five years apart as opposed to on the same year? This, there's already another one. Is it five years out? The, the third one, is it five years? No, that's uh, actually 10 years out. 10 years out, all right. So, um, you know, it would, if we could turn the clock back, it would have been nice if they had separated them by, you know, seven years each. Uh, but we're not there yet. Uh, the, as I understand it, the cost savings is about two and a half percent or so. Um, you're talking about um, you buy two. Right. vehicles that are about, you know, before you do much, $489,000. So, you know, two of them, you're, you're pushing, you know, a million bucks right. to, to buy two. And um, the 20-year-old the vehicles that we have, um, I'm not sure if this information that you got was if we would trade them into the company that we're going to buy the new ones from, but you know, we're talking about fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. If we sold it private sale, you might find somebody who would give you a little bit more than that. But based on our past history, I mean Gary's been around in the fire department as long as I've been the manager here. He hasn't been the chief the whole time, but uh, you know, we're not gonna sell one of these vehicles for fifty or seventy five thousand no. dollars. It just it's not gonna happen. So they're expensive when you buy them. You don't get much in return. Um, yeah, we would anticipate in talking with uh, the likely person that we buy the new trucks from. He also sells uh, when he can uh, used ones. He said it's it's really based on the market and, and what somebody is looking for. Um, he said he had he just sold one uh, for I think it was thirty thousand um, dollars, but it was ten years newer. Uh, that was used. So right. the, the longer you keep it, the less valuable it becomes. And then uh, how long do you sit on it? A number of years ago, the village sat on an engine because the board said, no, we can get a lot more money. And we ended up essentially giving it away for $1,000 uh, because it literally sat in the highway, uh, the armory garage, and just rotted it away. Yeah. So you don't want to sit on it long, and you want to try and take a, a good price for it. 
you know, and I think you got to balance that that weight. We haven't looked real closely yet. You know, um, the the difficulty and one of the reasons why the trade in value is so low is they're 20 years old. Number one and number two, the NFPA says that you can't. You know, they're not going to give you credit if you have equipment that's more than 20 years old. So, you know, I'm sure there are some fire departments out there that will buy a new vehicle and then keep it, you know, 14 years and, and try to sell it while it still has a little bit more life. But we haven't done those analyses. And for a department the size of ours, it's just, it, that's a lot of shuffling. We have a lot of other things that we have to buy. So um, we're not going to have a recommendation tonight. Next year is the 20th year, right? Right. So, you know, one of the things, as Gary said, was, well, would would be wiser to move one up to this year and then push one off to, you know, 2021, 2022, something like that, to get a little bit more separation. We don't know yet. And it's unfortunately not just the fire department that we have to look at. We've got paving, we've got uh, mm -hmm. highway vehicles all come out of the same right. pocket so and, and we're certainly uh, aware of that you know they're trying to balance what everybody needs you know there's there's needs and, and there's uh, less important wants but um, it, if we were to, to put one off a couple years after the first one then not only are you losing that savings you're increasing because it's going to cost more because it's two years later. So you have that right. increasing percentage. You've got to maintain it for those right. two or three and years, too. That's the vehicle maintenance line item. That's the bulk of our cost was those two engines. And, and just so you know, Gary will know exactly, but um, there was savings when the two departments merged. Uh, we, we did downsize the number of vehicles. They both had two full-size bumpers before. Um, so we, we did go down to three from the Correct. four we had. And you know I know that the center used to have what they call the mini pumper. You repurposed that. You went a different direction. So the merger did save the community significant money when you're looking at $490,000 for one vehicle. So we, we did realize that savings, but that savings happens once, and that was, <laughs> that was 19 years ago. Right, and, and we've, we've changed the direction for our engines you know, because they go on the interstate. Uh, the, although International is just down the road and um, their trucks aren't overly I guess for a truck overly expensive compared to some Peterbilts and some other trucks that are out there, um, they're not as safe as uh, the newer engine that we got. The, the, they're fiberglass, and fiberglass just doesn't hold up if you crash it. And, and it doesn't have to be our fault that uh, they crash. Um, like I said, we had one that was hit by a tractor trailer, and it cost, uh, I think it was like $35,000 in repairs. Um, but the, the engine that we have that is 10 years old, the newest one that we have, in that cab is a roll cage. Um, so the people inside there are safe, relatively compared. Um, there's no airbags, but uh, it, it does have a roll cage in it. Everybody is seat belted. Um, I have a very strict policy. Uh, you're gonna wear your seat belt. And you know, that was, that was a challenge for some people. Yeah. Well, I'll just put my air pack on because they're locked into a, a lock system and I'll just wear the air pack and I, it's it's for some people that go to crashes um, they're like well I don't feel safe seat belted well I have a pocket full don't care uh, <laughs> you're gonna, and now the trucks when they come out they actually have a monitor on them and the truck doesn't leave until all those little seat belt indicators go from red to green uh, we will sit there and Sometimes the driver or myself in the, in the officer seat or other officers will get snappy with people. It's like, buckle your seatbelt so we can go. And you know, when you're going to something serious, two seconds seems like a half hour. Mm. Um, but it's it's safer that way. It's um, it's that's how people get hurt. People get hurt when the trucks are backing up and nobody's backing them. We have a very strict policy about that. You better be able to explain why you're backing a truck up and nobody's behind it to guide you. Um, I, I just don't believe in close calls. Uh, 
So that shows up in your uh, in your workers' comp numbers that Bill shared with us. Uh, that line of work is not exactly a low risk thing, but to uh, to be able to see a decrease in workers' comp uh, insurance is remarkable, and it's a true testament to the the adherence to the training and the use of proper equipment and everything. And it's a it's a credit to you and your your department. That's for sure. Well, it's the officers that really. I, I just say what the policy is, and the officers enforce it, and I I'll help them. But uh, you know, we have a training committee. We have a, a training officer, and his job is to work with the committee of and his. Uh, three other officers to develop the training. The training satisfies our needs to maintain our national certifications, um, keep the training interesting. Um, but sometimes it's, you know, basic elementary stuff. Um, you know, mm -hmm. just because you go to a call and all of a sudden something didn't work just right, and rather than browbeating and we just include that elementary type training in our next training cycle. Our, our schedule is done for the year. So unless we get some opportunity to change that, I know what we're doing all the way through the end of December. Um, but that training uh, hits all the requirements that the state and our federal uh, certifications require. Is your uh, membership there for your volunteerism holding strong? 50 today. So. I mean, any indication that that could go one way or the other in the future? It's, it's odd because everybody around us is hurting. Stowe Fire Department uh, has a great department, um, but they were the premier department. They had a waiting list uh, for a long time, and, and they've dropped. And it's, it's, a, it's the people that are now living in Stowe. Um, well, that's part of the problem with... Stowe is that, uh, you know, if you look at Stowe's municipal staff, almost nobody who works for the town of Stowe lives in Stowe. You know? Correct. And uh, they just, you know, the, the local folks who used to join the fire department, they, they don't live there anymore. Right. Uh, and it's, it's too bad. And I think, you know, we, we're fortunate here. Um, housing costs are higher here than they used to be and it's tough for some people but we we've been able to maintain that i think it's also a testament both to the leadership in the department and the community that supports the department here um, people want to belong to an organization that care about their safe and care that they have the equipment to do the work and and it's an investment and i think you know um, it's, it's something that I think we've all worked hard on. I mean, I'm not a member of the fire department, but I think if you ask those folks over there, uh, I listen and no I, I, I hear what the needs are and, and try to figure out ways to make sure we give you what you need. Yeah. So yeah, you know, there's there's no question by any of the members that I, that certainly verbalize it to me about the support that we get from the community, the board, and, and certainly Bill. Um, we certainly would like some guarantee that we don't have calls when it's 20 below. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, that's when people use uh, more space heaters and stoke up their wood fires. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but no, we're 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 happy. We've we tend to, I, if I had to average them out, two new people a year because we have attrition. You know, we have people getting done. And said, hey, I've done 25 or 30 years, or sometimes it's 10 years. And, I've, I've had enough, and, and uh, then we get new people on. We've got a, a new group of people that just completed the Firefighter 1 2 training uh, last year. Um, and out of that group of five that we put through the training last year, we got two more new ones this year that will go. Um, they are full of energy, uh, and, it, and it's good for the older folks too because it you, know, you got these young people saying hey I want to show me how to do this show me how to do this it, it makes the uh, older folks feel a little bit better and say well okay you have energy and now you're 
forcing the energy on them. So we got a really good balance. And, and getting new people, young people, is great because it is not as easy getting up the next day when you've been wearing an air pack for a long time. And I don't do that very much. That's not my role. But um, I went up and helped Stowe uh, do a, a training burn. And I wore a pack, and I wore it for six hours. And for the next few days, I was feeling my age. <laughs> but it, it was fun. It made me feel good that I could actually still do that stuff. Yeah, I guess that's why I was asking there. Um, you know, just to, and I'm sure you're fully aware of it, but to keep an eye on that particular aspect because uh, you don't want it to be become a problem before it's too late. You know. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, it, I don't know. You probably already know that Stowe's um, current fire chief, Mark Saganis, is getting done. And Stowe is going to a full-time fire chief. Mm -hmm. um, there's there's some legitimate issues, and I'm certainly not here to say, hey, I need to be a full-time fire chief. I I just retired. I do not want to do that <laughs> job. Uh, but uh, you know, Stowe's a different uh, animal up there a little bit, and um, so th they are having uh, you know some different issues with recruitment, um, and they're hoping that. Uh, They've got a, a firefighter slash ambulance member that is, they're paying to do more work, and part of his work is recruitment and retention. Uh, it's good to recruit new people, but it's nice to keep the ones that you put a lot of money into. Uh, so it, I would love to be able to get Mark, uh, because he lives in Waterbury, and he's a still fire chief, to join our department. But he said when he's done, he's done. Uh, and I don't blame him. He's put in a lot of years. Yeah. I, I have a quick question before we jump off this. Um, and, I, and I know it all doesn't have to be talked through tonight. Um, back to the pump truck. Um, I know it's not this year's budget, but that is a major concern, obviously, that we might have to look at that large of an expense. Might be um, this year's budget. What's that? I said it could be. Oh, right. It could like be one this yeah. year. Um, maybe part of the strategy, and, and I look to you as an answer, is um, potentially buying one new one used and what's your opinion on used equipment is there a window there that makes sense to create the offset and are the depreciation curves straight or is there a potential opportunity to try to look at some used equipment to help save some money there it sounds like the ten, the one that's 10 years new or sold for 30,000 that sounds like a pretty big discount off of half a million but I understand that you're also looking at more maintenance it has use more risk I understand that so I don't know if you so one, getting a, a used engine, uh, that's what we're talking about, um, that's less than 20 years old is extremely rare. Um, you then, you're not getting the lifespan out of it, but you're also not paying as much, but you're also stuck with what you got. Uh, so when you, you, that engine is available, it looks like a good price, you buy it, you're buying what's there. You're not buying what works for water. And, you know, the, the the gear ratio uh, makes a difference. A lot of those trucks that get replaced in the cities are beat. Uh, so you might have one that's 10 years newer, but I'd be willing to bet that you wouldn't find uh, an engine that's like our 10-year-old engine down in New York City or Boston that looks anywhere near as good as ours does. Um, for a lot of those people, it's just a job. That there's, they go in, they work, they leave. Um, we have people at two o'clock in the morning when something wasn't working right, we'll stay there for another hour trying to figure it out and, and fix it before we have another call. So yeah, you can, you can buy a used one. I certainly would never support that, but if you, this board said this is what you're gonna do, I'd make a decision. Um, but I, I certainly wouldn't recommend getting a used engine. Yeah, that's good, I wanted to hear that. Yeah, uh, the tower truck's a different story. We, <clears throat> I would never support um, buying a new tower truck because the amount of use that we get out of it um, in a number of years is a good balance buying a good used one. Uh, a brand new one, uh, off the mark is a million dollars. I think it was like 1.3. Yeah, so you know, it, it's, it, that's something that you, you can certainly buy into is a tower truck and getting good use of them. We got a great deal um, with one we got. We've had good service. Um, and, uh, but an engine, 
you're getting somebody else's truck. They're getting rid of it at 10 years for a reason. And, uh, yeah, that's the one thing about fire equipment. It's, uh, you know, you're talking some big numbers, and, and like you said earlier, uh, at, the, at the end of its life, uh, there's not a big market for it. No. You know, there's there's limited, a limited market out there. Yeah. Very you, you will find a small department that will say, uh, we don't care about NFPA rules and we don't care about the insurance. Um, we just want a, a used truck and we're willing to pay fifteen, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 for a used truck even though we know that there are some downsides to that. But the upside to the trucks that we have is we keep, we have all the, the maintenance records from day one. So all those maintenance records go with the truck. So they can actually look at it and see uh, what we've done. We do monthly uh, maintenance work on. So the first Tuesday of the month, we do maintenance at the Main Street Station. And then the third Tuesday, we do maintenance at Maple Street. So at least twice a month, everything is started, turned on, run, pumped. Uh, anything that can turn on or start is done. Uh, that certainly leads to you know some uh, of the town mechanics work uh, when you find something's not working, but it's the way it is. Better then than out of fire. Yeah. You uh, leads to a question. Still feeling that you're getting good value from Eric, the town, town I mechanic. I cannot say enough good things about the value that we're getting from Eric. Mm -hmm. uh, I think. I didn't really know Eric other than he helped a local person build fire trucks, so I knew him from that, so I knew he knew fire trucks, which for me, when he came to work here, was a plus. The amount of money he has saved the town because he does the work as opposed to saying, eh, ship it elsewhere. We do sometimes for warranty work or big stuff, mm -hmm. uh, go down to like Clark's. Um, but uh, the, the cooperation we get with him and Celia um, I'm the only one, for the most part, that communicates with them. When, on a Tuesday night after maintenance, I get an email from the officer that was in charge of that maintenance night. Here's a list of stuff that needs that we found that were an issue. Sometimes it's just bulbs. Then one of the members will say, oh, they'll take care of it or whatever. But if it's a maintenance issue, I send uh, an email to Celia and Eric, and I prioritize. Uh, we had a pump that, that uh, stopped working. And so I sent them an email saying this is a priority. The next day it was fixed. Uh, so I, I, and we've actually called Eric at night. Um, that may not be fair to Celia, <laughs> but at 11 o'clock at night, he came and got our truck started when it was over by the old State Farm um, and got it running for us. And then I sent her an email saying, didn't mean to step on you, but it needed to be done. And uh, Celia's been great. So I got no complaints about that. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Gary. Thank you. Appreciate it. I like the call. <laughs> well, this is city here too much. Well, I don't even mind this. My wife would be rolling her eyes right now. <laughs> Thanks again, Gary. Yeah, no problem. Steve. -er. Yes, good evening. Okay, so Steve's here. Um, again, uh, pretty straightforward. Um, Budget this year in the planning department. Um, it's uh, $10,440 higher than it was last year, but that's only if you include the, uh, the uh, historic district that the historical society asked a question about. Uh, that's Steve will get to it, but that's about eleven, twelve thousand uh, dollars. So with that out, and I'm not suggesting that you take it out, but uh, I put it in the planning budget simply because it's a, a, a project that Steve's department would have something to do with if we go forward with it. So with that, I'll just quickly turn it over to Steve uh, and um, go forward. Okay. You got one already. Thank you. Good. So I passed out um, three different things, and uh, Bill said nobody requested paper, but being a good planner, I always come with plenty of paper. Uh, so, but I did try to really focus on the things that I thought you might have questions about. Um, there's a copy of Bill's memo. 
to you about the budget, which really just uh, hits a number of highlights, and I'll go over those with you. Uh, we also have three members of the Conservation Commission here. I know they've been very patient to wait through all this budgeting, so we will get to their uh, budget, and I know um, Alan and others, um, the two women may have some something that, uh, they'd like to contribute about their work and their mission and what they have planning on. I want to encourage that. So um, I'd like to kind of start from the top. And Bill, did you want to say anything about the uh, pay-related items before we get into the other items? Um, yeah, I think it was. I think I included it in my in my um, memo to you. Um, I haven't made a final decision yet. Steve and, and Dean and I have not talked. Nat and I talked a little bit after the last meeting. Uh, in 2018, uh, Dina, I believe, is, was budgeted for 30 hours a week. And um, she worked about 35 hours a week in 2018. We had the... Uh, you know, the, plan, the zoning rewrite, I'm sure she was involved in that, uh, as you can see from the amount of money that we took in in planning fees um, in 2017. Uh, it was uh, $22,075. And, I, uh, and uh, so she's worked a lot. So. Right now, this budget has her up to somewhere like 37 hours. Um, I think next week we'll talk about it. I'm seriously contemplating that maybe we just need to go to 40 hours. I looked back over the last five years for the planning fees, and I, um, I can't remember. I don't think I included it in the memo, but I included it in notes to myself in the budget. Um, Every year since 2014, the last five years, we've been over $20,000 except one year, and that was about 17.5. And I was thinking that it was an anomaly last year, but really, it's the, the revenue has been fairly consistent. I think it averaged about 21,000 over that five-year period. So we may have to go to a 40-hour time slot for Dina. Now, unlike the library, if we go from 30 to 40 hours, we don't risk any big, we're already paying retirement, we're already paying health insurance. So it's just basically you know, the, the wages plus incremental Social Security and incremental retirement. It's not you know, putting you into a whole different level. So anyway. Go ahead, okay. Steve. Good. Well, thank you, Bill. And I think um, what I would like to add is that our development review board has been very busy. And we're averaging about uh, three or four projects uh, every, uh, well, twice a month at each meeting, in other words. And this really drives a lot of the time that Dina spends. Uh, I help her out when the meetings are busy because I think it's a really important part of the service that we provide. Um, uh, many of the projects are residential, they are waivers, but um, people are very appreciative when we get them through the permit process. Um, it isn't always easy, but we manage to try to be encouraging and, um, and most, almost all the applications are approved. Uh, the commercial projects, and we have uh, had a significant number, some really good projects that um, I'm sure you're aware of, and that's driven the fees. Um, that that's the reason that we've been able to sustain these, these higher levels. So it's a reflection of our economic activity. And um, even though the main mission is issuing permits, it's uh, the process of getting people through um, the DRB, which uh, drives a lot of our time. And I do help out Dina. I want to make sure that we really provide a good service. I'll often sit in and kind of be the assistant um, uh, through that process. So uh, that's really just adding to what uh, Bill was saying. So let's go down through the items. And um, if you um, take a look at Bill's memo, uh, he highlights the professional services line. The Historical Society, as you may be aware, um, is very interested in doing a, an historic district survey for uh, Farrar's edition. And, um, 
I'll just send this map around. It's basically um, the area in the vicinity of Crossroads Beverage and um, the post office takes in Butler Street, um, Wallace Street, Prospect Intervale. And um, there's a surprising number of really nice historic buildings in that area. Most of them uh, you're familiar with, and there's some very interesting ones. Of course, the former um, Valley Rental was a car dealership, as many of you know. Um, Maxie's Market, uh, there was a creamery where Zachary's uh, Pizza, where the multifamily. Winnesquam. Oh, there we go. Good. So we have some good historians in, in our midst. Good. So the long and short is that the, uh, we got a proposal from Scott Newman, who did the survey work on the, um, the resurvey and the expansion of our Waterbury Village. Uh, district is a little over 11,000. Uh, Bill's put a $12,000 figure in here just to have a little bit of contingency. So um, this this is a project. I, I think it's your call whether we would do it this year or not. But uh, Bill wanted to get it in the budget uh, for discussion purposes. If you have uh, questions about that, I, I'd be glad to um, to answer them. I am involved. I was very involved in the. Uh, Resurvey and expansion for the Waterbury Village District, and I think it's um, you know it's good for our our uh, process, and I don't really think there's a there's a down any significant downside. So I think what I'd like to do is go down through the budget um, fairly quickly, and if you have questions, please uh, interrupt me. Um, can I can I ask yeah, you on that? You said there aren't any significant downsides. I guess the one question is is I know that when we um, define things as historic districts, there is potential for limitations on redevelopment. And since it's an area outside the floodplain, I would think that it would potentially be one of those identifiable zones for if we are looking at density that is walkable to downtown or is in the downtown area. Do you feel like potentially labeling that as a historic district would limit that? Well, it comes into play uh, in a couple different areas in um, the development scenarios. Certainly Act 250, if any projects have to go through Act 250. I don't know that there are any lots that are over an acre in this area. Uh, I don't know of any properties I can think of that are under Act 250 jurisdiction. I, I may be wrong. Um, conditional use um, does have no ad undue adverse impact to historic resources. Um, the, that really hasn't typically been an issue. Um, if the Planning Commission were to recommend um, an ex a design review district in this area, that might come into play. Uh, it, that really hasn't been a restriction on development, but it certainly it affects uh, someone who might want to demolish an historic building, this type of thing. I think overall it adds to quality. But um, it really depends on how the community wants to use a designation. Uh, I don't think there are any <coughs> properties in this area that are in the floodplain, so that that benefit doesn't um, go with the, with the designation. So um, it really depends on how the community decides to um, use this as, as a tool in terms of whether it might be a restriction or not. Okay. Uh, speaking to Act 250, um, have you been able to track or have any information on the proposed possible rewrite and how that might impact um, this particular issue and others here in the town? But they're, they're talking about possible changes in Act yeah, 250. Yeah, have you got yep. any word on how how that's progressing or what possible changes might? Right, right. I can give you just a real quick quick update on. Um, very involved in the Vermont Planners Association, and we as an association have been very involved in that process. We had a committee that worked. We had a representative um, advising the Act 250 Commission, which was five legislators, and they've um, completed uh, their work. They've um, sent their, they, they, the commission, has sent their work to the legislature. So. Now it's really going to be in the hands of the legislature to um, move any legislation forward. Nothing has been proposed yet. I think there's going to be um, a process, a vetting process, to look at uh, different options. So 
I can keep you posted because I'm, I'm on our legislative committee for Vermont Players Association. So, um, and the, the other aspect of our own development uh, uh, regulations are we're back into looking at that rewrite, and um, we definitely want to look at the whole one acre versus ten acre threshold for Act 250. So I think that whole topic is uh, we'll have more conversations later. Yep. So um, moving down through the, um, the budget, um, many of the items are remaining the same or about the same or slightly reduced, um, you know, in terms of legal costs. Uh, one of the ones that has gone up is travel. Um, I've been doing more, um, more travel lately. Um, I mentioned Vermont Planners Association. We have a three-state um, Northern New England chapter of the American Planning Association being, I'm the treasurer of Vermont Planners Association, we're reorganizing, so I've been going to the three state conferences and some other meetings, and I'm also involved with the Green Mountain Byway Project, which is now expanded to include five um, of Lamoille, Lamoille County towns, um, Morristown, Johnson, Hyde Park, and uh, Cambridge. and. Um, it's a really good project, good for economic development, good for tourism promotion, I think good for Waterbury and Stowe as well. So I've been traveling up to Hyde Park once a month for that project. Um, let's see, um, office equipment, uh, we are finally going to start replacing our computers. We've got a proposal from Bob Butler. I've gone over that with Bill. Uh, he's put in 1,700 um, into the proposed budget and then there'll be some um, of Bob Butler's time. So both Dean and I need to have our computers replaced. Um, mine will be done this year and Dina's the following <coughs> year. So um, we've got uh, also a couple of uh, grant projects. So I'd like to move back up and then we'll shift to the Conservation Commission. So um, let's see, let's take them in the order that they're presented here. There's two. There's one which um, is called uh, Special Projects Reservoir. This is the so-called breeder program. Uh, we work with Friends of Waterbury Reservoir. Um, this, I think, is the fourth year. We have, to be honest, we have not heard yet from their board whether they want to move ahead with an application. It's due in the middle of February. <laughs> so uh, Bill and I put a placeholder in of, um, of $2,500. And uh, they uh, received a grant of about $2,500 last year, so that's the reason for that figure. It's a pass-through. Uh, the money comes to the town, um, and then we cut a check to uh, the uh, Friends of the Waterbury Reservoir. So, so that's in as a placeholder. The other one that Jane and I are uh, very involved with is uh, labeled trees, special project trees. There's a $2,000 figure. Uh, we're both on our tree committee. I'm also the tree warden for the town. And um, this year's program that um, the state Department of Forest Parks and Recreation has, um, has put out the so-called canopy for trees is exclusively geared to the emerald ash borer. And um, as you may have heard uh, Emerald Ash Borer has been discovered in Barrytown, Montpelier, and I believe Plainfield. So it's kind of on our doorstep. Uh, once there's an infestation, it uh, starts at the top of the tree, it's hard to detect, and all of a sudden you find that trees are dying due to Emerald Ash Borer, and it, it will take out uh, probably 98% of our ash trees once uh, it's here. So it's, it, um, it's unfortunate, we want to be prepared, so we want to apply for a $2,000 grant. I um, passed around a description of our project. It would be twofold. Uh, one is that we've started an inventory of our roadside ash trees on the town roads that are within the town road right of way. And uh, we've done some inventory work on Little River Road where there are a lot of ash trees. We've uh, done Shaw Mansion Road. Uh, we've probably got somewhere in the vicinity of eight miles of um, wooded town roads that we'll be inventorying. Uh, the Central Mont Regional Planning Commission has funding to do these inventories, so this would actually uh, be the match for the $2,000 
a grant, and then uh, we'd like to spend the $2,000 to hire um, probably a forestry consultant or forester to do a preparedness plan. So that will look at issues such as, do we want to do some proactive removal of ash trees in the town uh, rights of ways, kind of a preemptive um, annual removal. Uh, because once the trees die, they become very brittle. They're much more expensive to remove. They're hazard trees. And uh, so um, many towns in areas that are becoming infested are being proactive in their starting uh, removal process. So the preparedness plan will look at that. Um, I got just a, a question about sure. that. You, you said that 98% uh, uh, infestation. Um, can you explain or have any information, maybe you or Alan, about where it goes from there? I mean, are we basically going to lose all our ash trees, or is this, are, is, this, is this bug a cycle bug? Does it come every 20 years or something? It's a new bug. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah it's it started a, out in the Midwest and uh, Michigan, and uh, Alan, you're more than welcome to jump in. Um, it moves slowly, um, just naturally, like a mile or two a year, but it's moved primarily by moving fire firewood and other products. So um, the answer to your story is the infestation peaks. Uh, it's about a 10-year cycle from early infestation to, um, you know. Complete devastation. Devastation, I guess you could say. There will be some ash that are resistant, uh, just like the elms. We're going to see probably some survival. Um, but the bug stays in the area. It declines, but it stays and reinvests, just like um, Dutch elm disease. So I think it's going to be with us for the long haul. There may be some resistant ash that will appear or will be developed, and I, I certainly hope so. There are, um, there are antidotes to this um, treatment. Put your mic on, Jim. I think the battery might be good. Sorry. Um, there are, there's an, towns are investigating, cities are investigating um, for street trees, um, treating, inoculating the trees. Uh, it's, it's expensive, but I can't give you a dollar amount. Rutland, initially, their tree warden was going to um, cut down most of the um, trees in Rutland. He's reconsidered, um, and they went out and they actually purchased equipment. There's two, there's two arborists that work there. Um, I know about this because I'm on the Vermont Urban and Community Forestry Council. So now they're reconsidering. They're going to be treating selected trees themselves. Um, about 1% of ash are supposedly resistant to this, and there's studies being done now in Ohio, and um, they are beginning to look at trying to develop resistant trees that can be sold. It's devastated trees in Michigan and the Midwest, um, huge areas of forest. On the other hand, which with the state urban and community forestry um, program is doing is, is promoting a slow the spread um, program to slow the spread of this, this disease by limiting moving of firewood and that sort of thing. And there'll be a lot more about that. And I, I would guess that might be something that we at the tree committee can also be doing some education um, in the town in the next year or two years as well. Steve, do, do you or Alan know what percentage of the trees in the forests around here are ash? It's about 5% from what I've heard. Yeah, in, in the town of the forested region of Watermere, in the village, it's a, a very small number of ash trees. No, I'm talking about in the, for, in in the forest. About 5% of the trees are ash trees. Right. Uh, some municipalities have planted a lot of ash. I'm not a proponent of ash trees just because they're prone to many different kinds of bores. But, um, Certainly, Shaw's has a lot of ash trees in their park and a lot community national bank. So we'll be working with some of the private landowners. Uh, and the treatment is fairly effective. It has to be done every two to three years. If they're specimen trees, they can be treated. A lot of ash up in the higher, not high elevation, but kind of mediocre high elevation. Yeah. Up where you are, Mark, there's a substantial amount. Yep. around that area. So uh, part of what um, we're requesting tonight, once we get through the uh, conservation uh, 
budget is um, that we would uh, request um, authorization to apply for this grant, a $2,000 grant from the Vermont uh, Department of Forest, Parks, and Recreation. So I think with that, unless you have qu other questions or Bill, unless you have some other comments. You have to get authorization for that grant tonight? Uh, yes, because it's it's due next week. It's right. due the 31st, so we did. So we should we just, we just do it right now? Yeah. Yeah, if you'd like to do a motion. Yeah. I'll make that motion. Your second? I'll second that. Okay. Any further discussion? All right. All those that uh, agree to approve the uh, grant for $2,000? $2,000, that's correct. For the tr tree services? Yeah, it's the uh, it's a Vermont uh, Department of Forest Parks and Recreation Caring for Canopy Grant Program is the title. Like I said. There you go. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Steve, I was out yeah. of the room for a minute. Did you sure. talk about the, his, the history? We did. Okay. Yeah, cool. I gave them the background on that. Yep. Yeah. And the, uh, the match for this $2,000 grant is going to be coming from the Regional Planning Commission? Right. It's coming from our Regional Planning Commission. So there's no cost in to the time, town. Thank you. services from the uh, Thank you. Good. So with that, um, Bill, did you want to say anything in introduction in terms of the Conservation Commission? I know you've been working with Aaron on their budget. Yeah, um, Aaron Hurley is here as well as Alan, and I'm not sure. Oh, I know Joan, I'm sorry. I was going to say I didn't know who the third person was, and there's Joan. She's always there. Anyway, uh, these folks are on the Conservation Commission. Um, I met with the commission along with Steve uh, a couple times this year just to uh, re-explain kind of the budgeting process. Um, there was a little misunderstanding maybe about uh, how the Conservation Commission was funded and, and what is being left in the conservation funds um, uh, fund balance. Uh, it's not very much money. But it's never been very much money, and uh, the Conservation Commission's budget a few years ago uh, that came out of Steve's budget was about $300, um, probably something to do with the flood and just not enough time to touch base. Uh, there wasn't a lot of uh, activity in that budget, so it has been cut to about $150. And this year, the proposal is to have uh, $700 go from Steve's planning budget or the town's planning budget to the Conservation Commission, and they have a budget of about $1,100 that they would like to spend, and somebody here is going to talk about what you'd like to do. Sure. Sorry, well, yeah, that would be great. I sent you the budget that uh, Erin and I had worked on, um, but I'll let her do the explanation of it. Yeah, sure. Thanks. My name is Erin Hurley, and I am the newly minted treasurer of the uh, Waterbury Conservation Commission. We put together this budget because we saw an uh, interest in the community for um, more um, in, in, in engagement events and um, to have speakers come and talk about uh, conservation issues in Waterbury. We hosted one in December that was standing room only with some local partners. And um, we've been kind of cobbling together these speaker events with partners without a budget. And we realize now that they're become so popular that we would like to like properly host them. And we have some speakers in line. We'd really love to um, have come talk to the town that have uh, speaker fees. And so this is an estimated budget. And I don't. You know, we this is for like at least two two events. It would depend on who we get and what their fees are. Um, we certainly don't think we'll go over this by any means, but we just want to be able to host um, host some uh, engagement events, and it could be on things like we talked about, like um, invasive species is a really hot topic right now, and a lot of people in town care about them and how to prevent them, how to identify them. Um, that's one thing we thought about doing in the spring, um, and. So we uh, are looking for, this is, this is not one of those things like, oh, we're asking for $700 this year and then $1,400 next year. This is very much a, we um, want some budget so we can do some, um, 
some things in the town, but we're not necessarily, this is not a, a, a grand scheme to like, you know, <laughs> keep asking for more money every year. Uh, I think that, I think that, that the interest is there, and I think that Waterbury is a town that has um, an amazing natural resources, and people are here because they want to be in the woods and exploring you know, the, the natural beauty and are really interested in the flora and fauna, and this is a really great way to educate and um, make connections with our local partners. Um, we've had great success in the past in these endeavors. And would like to continue with a little, uh, some more support from the town. Well, I agree with you about the natural resources. Um, I'm always amazed when I turn off 100 onto Guptill Road and I can just look at the Worcester Range. And the other day it was all snow capped, and uh, I just said to myself, no wonder what continues to bring people up here. You know, I've just been here 59 years and never get tired of it. Uh, so I completely understand what you're what you're saying. Um, I'm glad to see that uh, you're interested in having new new uh, people come to speak about different things, such as invasives, because you know I'm concerned about that as well. Um, so I'm interested to see you know what what some of these people have to say. Um, and I think as time goes on, it's uh, important to try to. You know, as the town continues to grow, it's important to try to make people aware of the fact that uh, we have some important things here that we need to do what we can to try to hang on to. Because as you grow, you know, those things, for whatever reason, slowly get eaten away at and disappear. Uh, I've said it more than once that uh, that picture that's behind your head uh, will probably be some of the last uh, last real uh, uh, things that you can look at that uh, tell what we once had, you know, because farms are going by the wayside left and right. So uh, it's great that you guys are sticking with it. And uh, Yeah, we have some really nice, um, uh, the, the, the commission right now has a lot of really good dedicated members that are working really hard. And I think that they're, that, um, we, you know, are, are well situated in that we have a lot of connections in different organizations, so we don't need a huge budget to do a lot of work and help promote all the great work that um, local nonprofits and other, like, committees are doing to help preserve Waterbury. And I think that, like, uh, the town hosting an event where everyone can come together and talk about an issue that really concerns everybody, like invasive species, um, it, you know, it's just a prison as an opportunity for us to really host like a forum of concerned people and make those connections and, you know, hopefully see results too. So. Good thing I want to add is that um, the Conservation Commission has been really well engaged with the Planning Commission and um, one of their members is now uh, attending our, our meetings and is getting engaged in the um, Unified Development Regulations. Uh, We'll be looking at the higher elevation areas and other uh, aspects of the regs that are natural resources oriented. So I think that's really great that you know we're collaborating. We've collaborated on the municipal plan. That was a really good start. I think that's going to that's going to continue. Uh, we'll be looking at the Shootsville Wildlife Corridor and other uh, travel corridors for wildlife, and um, you know how we may want to address those through uh, the, the regulation of development. So. Uh, so I think you'll hear more, especially as we get into some of the details on the on the uh, development regulations about the um, the collaborative work that you're talking about. Am I reading this correct? That basically it's a net cost of three hundred dollars. Is that? Am I looking at the wrong for the conservation Com commission? There's a revenues of eight hundred and expenses of eleven hundred. Is that the total budget for the conservation commission? Yeah. Is that en enough? Like, <laughs> I mean, like, we look at all the other, you know, departments and how much we're putting into them, and I mean, like, I don't see, I mean, the ask is almost nothing, and, like, I feel like if it's 
where you feel, do you have any feeling like if we give you an extra thousand dollars, what would that mean to the conservation commission, or is it just not? I, I don't. I've never seen you jump up so quick, hey, Alan. It's already been a, like a seventy-five thousand percent increase. Yeah, yeah. So far. yeah, yeah really. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we will ask for next year. <laughs> this uh, eight hundred dollars uh, does not uh, include the fund balance that's already there. No, that's so so the the I, I didn't give you this. Right, it's uh, like three hundred. Forgot to bucks. hand it out, but they've got a fund balance of about three hundred eighty dollars. Uh, the ask this year right now is seven hundred dollars coming from property taxes, which would come out of the planning budget. Uh, I just suggested that they might get a hundred dollars worth of uh, donations, people, you know, just helping to pay for some of the speaker events uh, or the refreshments or whatever. Uh, so they'd have eight hundred dollars worth of revenue, and then add that to the three hundred and eighty-two dollars worth of fund balance that they have, and spend the eleven $1 hundred dollars that uh, is in Aaron's budget, and they, they would end the year with about eighty bucks. So, um, yeah, I, I asked them to go slow, and they, they were really good uh, learners, um, and, and they, they did what they were asked. But I think, you know, I, I also tried to encourage them to put things in that they thought that they uh, needed. And Alan, maybe while you're answering Mark's question, you can also give them an example of what some of these conservation projects might be. So the budget that, that we presented this year is essentially operating budget. And the Conservation Commission's mission is to promote um, cultural resources, natural resources, historical resources, recreational resources. It's a big, long ask. And the job of the commission is to kind of guide the community's community and social wants and, and then to try to collect resources to help those conservation, the actual conservation activities. We haven't done much of the conserving side as much as we have just trying to do some education and outreach. So this is a continuation of the education outreach projects, but over the last five years, we've really garnered a lot of interests, almost to a culminating point that over the next few years, we're gonna be closing on three to four pretty high profile land conservation projects that will be putting some acreage into perpetual easements and um, through our partnering organizations with, with the Schutzfeld stuff. So Vermont Land Trust, Nature Conservancy, Stoll Land Trust have all kind of garnered their own pot of money. And to date, um, we've been supportive just by engaging with the community but haven't asked our own community yet to to, to pony up any dollars so i actually expect that so, at some time in the future and especially as we start to see growth occur in waterbury that we're going to start to come to the town and to the residents to start to ask to increase budgets not necessarily for operating costs but to use tax dollars to support conservation activities we haven't done that yet but Land values in Vermont means that conservation activities, at least from a kind of a perpetual easement side of things, are expensive projects. And um, I'll just for the sake of privacy, if I had a, my property is a 30 acre property, if I wanted to sell a conservation easement on that property, it's valued at maybe $75,000. That's a really rough guess. but. You have various pots of money that then the town would be, we, you, we could go to the town, the municipality and the residents to be helping to pay for some of that cost. Much of it would come from kind of other funds, but um, you know, we would be essentially coming to, to the town for that money in some point in the future. We've got a, about a half a million dollar budget for some of these upcoming projects, most of which we'll probably just do our, private, our own private fundraising for. It would be great that in the future, and I expect this to happen, that in the future we'll come to some town meeting to for the good grand pitch for, for something like that. So you think at this time Mark's suggestion is? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, it's what worth receiving, or is there no reason, unless you've got something in front of you that it's, it's you're putting it forward to? Is it? We do have. There is a um, conservation fund that was adopted in April um, 2010 by the select board, and. We do see that as an opportunity for like something that like a, a, like an extra thousand dollars could go to that, and we we could. Do you want to talk about a little bit like of the type of projects that could we could do through that? Like with small pots of money um, could, that could support some of these community collaborations that are working on very large things, but need a little bit sure. of money to for you know lawyer. You can you can speak right. to that. We have two hundred and fifty dollars yeah. in the budget for that this year. Yeah. So. So the conservation fund is a separate line item in the budget that would be would, would accumulate donations or tax dollars, and and then it would they would roll over every year, and we would if I wanted to come to the town and say hey can we support Alan's conservation easement of his property, we could go to the conservation fund for that pot of money, and it would accumulate over time. That's the hope that it would just accumulate over time, and then. Conservation Commission that would be asked to entertain applications to draw from the conservation fund. And if, using Mark's example, we don't need any more operating budgets, but if we were to increase the budget of the thousand dollar to increase it to two thousand dollars, a thousand dollars of that money could go into the conservation fund. So we're slowly accumulating the conservation fund so that when we do have a conservation project, and somebody needs a, a big pot of money, once every 10 or so years, we've got a big pot to draw from. And, and When you say so big pot of money, is okay. over 10 years, $250 is $2,500. Is that big in that world, or is that really? Over $1,000. No, we're, we're in the real estate world, so it's not. But it's not, I mean, $1,000 a year, even if you went to the, for the 1000 in 10 years, you'd only have $10,000, so. So, so the yeah. conservation, that, that line item for $250, um, in, is your intent to just save that for these types of things? Because that's, that becomes and, and CIP, I, I apologize, basically. but if that's what we were talking about, I, I thought I tried to steer you away yeah. from that, because when the, and none of you were here when the select board kind of agreed to establish a conservation fund, but there was, there was animated discussion amongst the select board, and there was the same animated discussion at town meeting that we're willing to set up a conservation commission, but we're not willing to put tax dollars into for conserving land. And, and it, it's, I'm not suggesting that's of a stream that you never can cross, but that conversation would have to come up. I thought this conservation project was something that you were going to, another program that you were going to run, you know, yeah. go out and pull invasives yeah, or something right. like that mm -hmm. this year. I was not expecting that to be set aside because if it was going to be set aside, there'd be money coming out of the, out of the planning budget and it would go into the revenue line up in the in the top of this page, which I, I failed to send out to you. And you know, there's donations in trust and and donations no, for I think you're correct, Bill. conservation we were, projects. Yeah, so. we were expecting to do something with the two hundred and fifty dollars right. this year, as in like a com supporting a community effort in you know w last year did we have did we have something with the um, with river cleanup or? Well, we will be able to spend that $250 on a conservation project like the ones I described. It's not $10,000, but we. Um, well, that, that wasn't, I mean, that's up to the board and it's up to the voters. That was not my understanding. My understanding was it was going to be some type of hands on project mm -hmm. that was. Physical work or yeah, I guess, something I guess that was we, done like that. Yes, I guess we're we're waiting to see what what our, the community might need, correct? But I feel. I mean, do you want to continue? And, and I'm not, I want to make sure that I, I'm not against setting aside money for conservation, for the type of conservation Alan is talking about. I think it's very worthwhile, and I think it's a discussion that we should have. I think from 
back in 2010 when the Conservation Commission was established, it was pretty well understood then that we weren't going to be setting tax money aside. Mm -hmm. And if somebody made a donation, you know, if, if I made a donation to the Conservation Commission and said, put this in your, you know, donations and trust line, uh, and then you can use it for something that Alan does, the Commission has the ability to do that. It's just whether it should be done with tax money or not right now. And no. right now, all of their funding has been so, tax money. Would so you suggest Would you suggest it be more appropriate if they were like this thousand dollars that may go into a kitty? Wouldn't that be wiser to put in under a special article? Well, that's your that's your choice. Yeah, but. I would think. Yeah, so there's a lot of fees associated with land conservation too, and there's a lot of um, you know studies and things you have to do prior to like being able to purchase land, and so we there's a as far as Shootsville goes, and there's some other um, land that, that community that that um, yeah, a, revitalizing Waterbury now has um, the what, what are they calling it now? Not the Waterbury. Um, Land Trust with a Waterbury Land Initiative. That Waterbury Land Initiative, thank you. <laughs> and so to have, uh, if someone came to us and wanted town support and, you know, co co coming up with some extra money for a river project or for lawyer, like fees or, you know, something to get something off the ground and started and have Waterbury Town support it. Yes, of course, with um, $250 or, you know, a thousand extra dollars. We are not buying land, but there are a lot of steps that the town could support in, and it, and it would look good to have the town support it in partnership with some of these. So that's it, it's you know there's no money in that line item until this budget, and then so we'll see kind of the needs of the town and right. how we could use and, that. And, and if, it was the idea was to create an opportunity. If the if the intention was that this $250 be used for the types of things like, you know, the conservation easement on Allen's land, I wouldn't, I would just say instead of having $250 in the expenditure line item of conservation projects, that there would be, you know, uh, of the 700 that we're giving, you'd put 500 in the from the property taxes, and then you put two hundred and fifty dollars into the into the donations and trust line, and then that way that that would be earmarked, and it would it would stay earmarked for a future conservation project, and it couldn't be spent unless the select board approved it, like we had talked about before. So it's just a matter of semantics. But I was thinking that the two hundred and fifty that you were asking for this year was really more going to be for a river project or. Some yeah. type we were too, Bill. Yeah. project like that. We're just saying, we were answering the question if we were cutting these, get more money. <laughs> if the town is yeah. going to be supporting us in a much larger uh, way for conservation, that we could find. Ways. So I'd say that I would certainly support increasing the budget because I think it's been kind of underfunded for a few years, and I think that we have a great um, need for more. Um, community education on this topic and community activities to bring us all together. I was at the um, standing room only event in December. It was fantastic about connectivity. And, you know, we were at a critical location at the junction of, you know, Route 100, the interstate, and then we have, you know, all the state forest and natural land that really needs to be conserved. Some of it is conserved already because of where it is located, but I just think our town is a big issue for our town. So I would definitely support in the future entertaining, you know, going forward with some other mechanism, which maybe in 2010 seemed um, to be difficult, but maybe we are at a point going forward where we could entertain some mechanism to put some revenue more into the Waterbury Conservation Fund so that some pro projects could actually be c purchased or easements could be facilitated because it seems really, you know, like a great need that we have that's unmet. I, I wonder too, you know, the fight that we did with the cell phone tower, would that be considered something that if we were funding something on a yearly basis, we could have looked to to help 
if the, it was you know a CIP that that would help fight projects like that. You know that ended up costing us probably ninety thousand or more. Um, but that came fast and more. Yeah. So you know that came fast and unbudgeted where we didn't really have a fund to pull from there. It just became something on the, the yearly budget. But even potential future fights like that, I think if we were slowly funding something that could help with those, I think it would start to make sense. But I mean, um, I'll leave it there. I don't know. Two, can I provide two other updates from the commission while we're on, on this? Um, in support of the Schutzville partnership, the Nature Conservancy just purchased a few acres across from Ruby Raymond Road. So they now own what we had kind of called the Keystone, a Keystone parcel. It's just a really small parcel right on the boundary of Ruby Raymond, right on the boundary of Toast. Stolen Waterbury, across from Ruby Raymond Road, um, next to Lawn Rangers. And it's a, a few acres eight acre parcel, they bought it outright for, I don't know, I don't know. It, it was a high number, but um, they're not gonna be, they don't wanna hold onto it. They bought it to kind of take it off the market and they'll be looking to find some new owner or new ownership model. And they've said on numerous occasions, Alan, why don't you go out to town to see if they wanna take the parcel. This is, that's that, oh. Okay, maybe. <laughs> so the purchase of that parcel is the intent to preserve it, correct? They bought it and they've put a permanent conservation easement onto it. And they've accomplished their first goal of that. So that's kind of the, that's the first conservation project associated with the Schutzville partnership. And I anticipate seeing a few more this calendar year. Um, but they would like to sell it. The, that particular transaction, they don't want to hold on to it in perpetuity, right? I, I don't, are they interested in selling it or just having somebody hold it? I don't think they can give it away. So yes, I think they're interested in selling it, and I, but I, I don't think they can, like was your question also suggesting to get rid of an easement too? Pardon? To sell an easement or do, like donate an easement? Donating. I thought they just didn't want to hold it on their books, so they needed somebody to hold that easement. So the town could hold so that easement? Town hold easement. Would mean the town would spend the money, pay them. That's already happened. So that if a piece of property money. like that has an easement on it, basically restricting anything, uh, how is that taxed? And is it always, I mean, Realistically, something like that shouldn't have any tax value at all, uh, because there's really nothing that humans can do with it. It's being left to wildlife. Um, that's the problem that you know. That's one of the problems that uh, that the conservation commission, I believe, has to deal with is the fact that somebody's got to own those properties and if there's a restriction on it preventing development at all the burden is still there to some degree of taxation property taxation correct right but i mean i, I don't know what the easement is but uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily restrict every activity. I don't know anything about this property, but you could probably manage it for, you know, a woodlot or whatever. I mean, sure, you know, it's a yeah. 30, 50 year cycle where you can do anything, but uh, it would be taxed at its use value, like everything is supposed to, you know, it's highest and best use. And at that point, if you can't develop it, its highest and best use is minimal. Yeah, is that what it? it Am I understanding things incorrectly here? Is that why you think that people want to perhaps either turn the easement over or turn the property over because of the tax burden? That's just a um, question. They, are, they don't want to be in the business of being landowners anymore. I see. It's a nature conservancy? It's Correct. a nature conservancy. Oh, this this is, this is it still land trust interested in? Yeah. yeah. Okay. We're not going to be able to yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 so. um, That's something right. conservation organizations do all the time. It's a, it's a big, it, municipalities need money, residents only have so much. 
you know, and the formula is taxing on development value. So um, the, the other update I want to provide is that the Waterbury, Waterbury Land Trust now is a nonprofit organization that was formed uh, in December. Which, it's not called the Waterbury Land Trust. Waterbury Lands Initiative. Yeah. i got to get that right. W-L-I, okay. Waterbury Lands yeah. Initiative, um, that I'm on the board of. And we are, our mission is to kind of facilitate land conservation and culture, more cultural, recreational kind of conservation issues in a nonprofit kind of private side of things, taking it away from the municipality. So there's another entity currently we're working on in the auspice of of revitalizing Waterbury, who serves as our fiscal agent. Um, but uh, he makes a work for a new version group there, which is kind of cool. All right. The board's all set, and you guys are all set. Thank, yeah. thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Call it a night. Okay. Yeah, unless you have questions. Well, thanks. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bring it over there. Okay, uh, I take it we'll have to go into executive session or not. Carol's going to have somebody read a motion. Okay, so the first motion uh, I will make is to find that general public knowledge of the details of potential litigation involving the town of Waterbury would clearly place the town at a substantial disadvantage. And that needs a second. Second. Okay, the motion has been made and seconded. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, say aye. 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 And the second motion is to enter executive session to consider potential litigation involving the charge of Mr. Oak and KO versus Town of Waterbury and related confidential attorney client communications made for the purpose of providing legal advice to the town. Is there a second to that? A second. Okay. Any further discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor, say aye. 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 aye.